you for uh, having me as the speaker for this, uh, this session. Uh, it is an honor to be here, and uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I am just going to go ahead and launch into my PowerPoint because I put together a bit of a presentation here. Um, I was thinking as I went into this that I don't necessarily know uh, what pharmacy students do and do not know or what they're and are not taught uh, about a lot of different aspects of vaccine law that may be important. Um, and I want to present some of these things that about how drug, how vaccines and other pharmaceutical products uh, generally are tested and approved for use because uh, when you are practicing pharmacy, you're sort of on the front line of dispensing medication to patients. And when it comes to vaccines in particular, uh, you may have people who have misinformation or questions about the functioning of vaccines, uh, and you should be equipped to answer those. So I'm going to start with, this is of course my uh, my introductory slide. This is my book, Vaccine, Vaccination and Immunization Law. And people are often curious as to why I as an individual uh, got into the field of vaccine law, what, what, what draws someone to be a vaccine law expert. Um, and really, as, as mentioned in the introduction, I was a law clerk on a court called the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit in the United States. Um, the uh, Congress decided at some point that it would be great if there was one central court that handled all the patent cases so that we wouldn't have um, a lot of different opinions on whether patents should be issued in certain circumstances. So they brought those together uh, in the federal circuit. And then so the court wouldn't only be doing patent cases. They gave it a bunch of other kind of buckets of jurisdiction, one of which was jurisdiction over the United States Court of Federal Claims. Um, now, as it happens, there is a statutory uh, process set up whereby if you assert that you've been injured by a vaccination in the United States, you can't sue the vaccine manufacturer, you can't sue the person who administered the vaccine, uh, at least not initially. You have to go through um, a special court that is set up under the Court of Federal Claims only for adjudicating vaccine injuries that pays uh, people out of a fund established by the U.S. government. And those cases are also appealed to the federal circuit. Uh, so there came a time when I was actually working on a case for a patent for a new invention and new kind of vaccines. Um, at the same time as I was working on a vaccine injury claim uh, that had been appealed from federal claims. And I had this sort of light bulb moment that there are all these different areas of law uh, where the law as a whole bends towards this really strong public policy preference that people be as protected against the spread of infectious disease as possible, uh, which makes a great deal of sense. We don't want diseases spreading through society. We've recently seen what happens when a disease um, spreads broadly that can cause a lot of illness and death. Um, and even before COVID-19, there were vaccine law issues that were constantly in the news. There were uh, there's an anti-vaccine movement that has been strongest in the United States, but has been spreading around the world. Um, and the success of the anti-vaccine movement has led to measles outbreaks and things of that sort. Um, and it's remarkable that it's still a successful movement in the face of that, but it is. And I consider the field to be very broad. It ranges from the administrative state and how vaccines are licensed and regulated to the intellectual property questions like the patent question that I think. Um, to the entire structure of vaccination mandates and, and who has the authority to require people be vaccinated in order to have access to education and things of that sort. And of course, uh, the vaccine injury compensation program that I just mentioned. So I have a grand theory of the law that I always like to present when I begin these things. And that is the law as a whole is composed of codifications of common sense, like you can't kill people, uh, you can't steal from people and things of that sort arbitrary cutoffs, uh, such as in the United States, you have to be 18 to vote, uh, 21 to buy alcohol, uh, 16 to get a driver's license. There's nothing uh, inherently special about turning 16 or turning 18 or turning 21 that applies to all people that makes that the date on which those things are, are sensible. But you have to have a number and that's the number that got picked. And then you have a lot of historical and traditional rules arising out of a lot of weird situations. So there are a lot of 
laws and cultural customs and mores that get uh, codified into law um, that just come out of things that happened hundreds of years ago and uh, occasionally there's a reform movement and those get swept away. So what even is a vaccine? And again, I don't know, um, you know, I, I know that as pharmacy students, you're a lot of chemistry and biology. I don't know if you're taught specifically how vaccines work, but I always like to use this illustration. Here's the Milky Way. It has over 200 billion stars. Uh, but then you have the human body that has over 30 trillion cells in every human body, which means that every single one of us has something like 1,500 times as many cells in our body as there are stars in our entire galaxy. Um, and that's phenomenal. That's a, a huge number of things going on in the body. But even more remarkably, perhaps, there are more microorganisms living in your body than you have bodily cells of your own body. Uh, and those microorganisms able to, to be so populous because um, they tend to be much tinier. Uh, the biggest things that we have, we have bacteria, which may be a hundredth the size of a normal body cell and viruses, which may be a hundredth the size of a bacteria. They're un inconceivably tiny, um, but we have an entire flora of these microorganisms living in our bodies all the time. And a lot of them are beneficial to us. We have gut bacteria, um, the single largest collection of, of any kind of cell in your body are gut bacteria that are floating around that aid in our digestion. Um, but there are things that are harmful to us that get into our system. And here we see a white blood cell chasing down a bad bacteria and devouring it. And how does it know that it's supposed to devour it? Well, when something gets into your system that's not supposed to be in your system, bacteria or a virus, it causes some kind of damage to your cells. Um, and that damage releases chemicals into the body that can be detected by particles that are floating around in your body at all times, looking for cell death and signs of things that are going wrong. And when they find particles that are causing damage, when they find a bacteria, when they find a virus, they literally feel the surface of it and say, well, I detect this molecular structure and I'm going to have the body create a chemical that sticks to this molecule, that'll stick to the spike protein of this virus, for example, or do something on the exterior of this bacteria and signal the white blood cells, you got to come eat this thing. Um, and that's kind of where we get into vaccines. A vaccine is a trick. So the United States Food and Drug Administration defines a vaccine as an immunity in the administration of which is intended to stimulate the immune system to result in the prevention, amelioration, or therapy of any disease or infection. Very long, winding, fancy definition. But a vaccine is a trick. Um, it's a sleight of hand. It's putting something into your body that makes your body think that it's being attacked by a bad organism so that it sets up that defense. It creates that chemical that will stick to that bad organism. Um, so your white blood cells will come in and devour it. Uh, and that's wonderful because you get the benefit of having that defense set up without actually having the illness, particularly if it's something really bad like uh, measles or polio. Uh, you don't want those things in your body. And if you can get an immune response to them without actually becoming sick with a disease, um, then that's, that's a great benefit to you. Um, I always like to be very clear on the terminology. And of course, this is an international forum, so there may be a lot of different languages to play. In the English language, there's there's an old saying that uh, that the English language corners other languages in dark alleys and shakes it down to steal spare grammar from its pockets. The English language mixes together pieces of all the different languages. But a vaccine is a substance, and in fact, the word vaccine comes from vaca, meaning cow, because the first vaccine developed. Um, was a smallpox vaccine. Smallpox is a terrible disease, which you'll never have to worry about because we eradicated it with vaccines about um, 40 years ago. It was declared eradicated. But in 1796, an English physician uh, hypothesized that people who get sick with a different disease called cowpox never become ill with smallpox. Cowpox was a less harmful disease, so he uh, figured that there was something in the bodily reaction where if you got cowpox, 
it would also immunize you against smallpox. And he took the eight-year-old son of his gardener and intentionally infected him with cowpox and then intentionally infected him with smallpox and voila, demonstrating the child did not get smallpox. Um, so a vaccine is a substance. Uh, it's the substance that, you're, that is injected in the body. The process of injecting that is vaccination. Um, in the old days, they used to call it inoculation. Uh, and the intended result is immunization. And you'll see a lot of, we're in World Immunization Week now, um, and you'll see a lot of conflation of immunization with vaccination because vaccination is the major process for bringing about immunization. But of course, you can also develop immunization um, through actually having the infection. So people talk about natural immunity. Uh, that is a thing that exists. Usually it's not the preferable route for immunity because you face all the risks of having whatever the disease is you're becoming immunized to. There are some other methods. There's use of antitoxins where you have an animal and the animal breeds the, the uh, microorganisms bred in the body of the animal. So the animal develops those chemicals that'll stick to it. And then you take samples of the animal's blood and you actually um, isolate out the chemical and inject that into people. And now they have a chemical in their blood that will attract white blood cells. Uh, and it's not a vaccination because it hasn't uh, been developed. They, they're developing that chemical hasn't been done the introduction of something. It's just the actual chemical itself has been put in the body. So there are different routes to immunization. Um, and you'll see in legislation, and this is around the world, legislators often confuse and confound these terms and talk about um, immunization when they should be specifying vaccination for various purposes, but I like to make those clear at the outset. Now, in a typical vaccine, you actually have a number of different ingredients. Um, first of all, most vaccines are formed by isolating a sample of the microorganism. You get this bacteria or this virus, and you figure out what makes it tick. Um, and you can perhaps breed that bacteria or that virus through successive generations in some kind of medium until you breed a version that is different enough from the original that it won't harm humans, uh, but still similar enough that it will instill a response. Or you can weaken it through various means, through introducing it to chemicals, radiation, things of that sort, um, so that it's less harmful to the body when it's put in. Um, or you can use, a, in some cases, a killed organism. So the, the virus is dead or the, the bacteria is dead, but putting it in the body will still stimulate a response, even though it can't do any harm because it's not living. Um, the, the one that I worked on the patent for when I was on the federal circuit was very interesting. It was splicing part of the organism uh, that is like a, a spike protein or some part of the organism that will catch the attention of the immune system onto an inert microorganism onto a kind of bacteria that doesn't harm the body at all. Um, but you put a piece of the harmful one and literally, literally graft it on, and the body will recognize it as if it was the harmful one. And then most recently, we have come to mRNA vaccines. So when a virus gets into your body, it invades a cell. The cell every cell has a mechanism for repairing and reproducing itself um, that takes in raw materials and turns them into DNA and other things. And the virus hijacks that mechanism and uses it to make copies of the virus. And it will do this in every cell in your body if it can, uh, which is why viruses can be very bad for you and they can kill you because they're corrupting a lot of cells. An mRNA vaccine does kind of the same thing the virus does. It takes over your cell's repair mechanism, uses it to make copies of itself, but it doesn't make reproducing copies like a virus. It just makes a piece of the virus. In the case of the uh, mRNA COVID-19 vaccine, it makes a copy of the spike protein and sends that out into your system. And your body says, what is this nasty thing floating around? I'm going to create a protein that, that sticks to it. Um, and so that spike protein is identified and, and eliminated when the real virus enters your body. Um, mRNA vaccines do not contain adjuvants. But I'm going to tell you what adjuvants are, because uh, a lot of other vaccines do contain them. If you have a weakened virus or a dead virus vaccine, that might not be enough to stimulate the body to make a response. If you put some, you know, some of, a, of a dead virus into the person's body, 
and it's not doing anything, it's not causing any harm, the body might not react to it. Adjuvant is an irritant. Um, it's usually a salt of some kind that gets the immune system really angry. It's like, what is this that's bothering me? And then the immune system detects the dead virus and thinks that must be the thing and, and reacts to it. Um, I like to joke, it's like uh, when you go to a bar with a friend who's looking for a fight, um, that goes over in some places and it doesn't in others, but I think it's a, a fairly universal experience. Some vaccines also contain antibiotics, so the vaccine itself does not become infected with bacteria or other microorganisms. Preservatives to make them last longer. This is particularly important uh, for vaccines that are manufactured in one country and need to be delivered someplace else around the world or to remote locations. Um, vaccines are typically cultured in a medium like eggs or an animal serum. Uh, this can create problems by itself. Some vaccines are cultured in bovine serum. And there are uh, bovine means from a cow. Um, Hinduism is a large religion where the cow is considered sacred. And there may be people who come from that religion who say, well, I don't want vaccines because uh, certain vaccines are cultured that way. Some vaccines are cultured in porcine serum, which is from a pig. Again, in Islam and Judaism, there are prescriptions against uh, using products that come from pigs, and people may object to vaccines on this great on these grounds. Um, other vaccines are cultured in chicken eggs, and there may be people who are vegetarians or vegans and and find that um, discomforting. Um, there are responses to those, uh, but another important aspect of this is that every component in the vaccine, independently and as a whole, when combined together, has to meet the same regulatory burdens. And this is the same around the world. Um, if you're producing farm product to a market for people to use, uh, there's going to be some agency that oversees the safety and effectiveness of those products. Make sure that no one is selling something that has not been demonstrated to be generally safe. And you know, safety is relative to the degree of safety, uh, relative to whatever it is the thing it's treating. So if you're looking at something like a rabies vaccine, which is very rarely administered, it's only when someone's been bitten by an animal with rabies. Rabies vaccine can cause a lot of uh, a lot of negative response, but rabies is a very deadly disease. So you know you're willing to put up with the harm that the vaccine causes if it prevents you from dying from the disease. Um, but most vaccines are relatively inert in their responses. So um, all of those components and all of those uh, individually and as a whole are through certain processes. And uh, here we talk about clinical trials. And I think it's important for everyone to understand that pharmaceutical products are put through a very rigorous clinical trial process and are reviewed very thoroughly by people who are um, very thorough professionals, experts in their fields, understand what they're doing, know what they're doing. Because you know that's one of the first things that you get from people who are opposed to vaccination is they don't believe that the regulators know what they're doing. They think that there's some harmful product being put on the market and that uh, it's getting a rubber stamp. It's you know going through the door that the agencies required for regulating them are somehow captured or controlled by the pharmaceutical companies and, and therefore willing to put harmful things onto the market because there's uh, some profit margin at the end of it. And I can tell you that is not true. The people who work for FDA and for comparable agencies around the world tend to be very conscientious and have great skill and expertise in what they do. Um, and the FDA as an agency has oversight over all pharmaceutical products. Uh, in the United States, the FDA fines pharmaceutical companies billions of dollars every year uh, over whatever kinds of mishaps or missteps that they have with other pharmaceutical products that they're selling, um, whether they're, they're advertising a, a, a heart drug and overstating its effectiveness or something like that. FDA monitors that very uh, effectively. And the fact that uh, they're doing that with those drugs, you know, vaccines are actually much less of a profit center for most pharmaceutical companies that make vaccines than other kinds of drugs that uh, tend to cost a tremendous amount more money. You know, come up with a drug that, that grows hair for bald people, you're going to make a huge fortune on it. 
On vaccines, not so much, even though there's a tremendous volume of them, um, they cost, there, there's very little that people pay for them. Uh, so we go through this clinical trial process. First thing we do is we test it on animals. Now that's controversial by itself, but there is currently uh, a requirement for animal testing to make sure that something is not just harmful to living things. We try to test vaccines on animals that have an analog in their um, biology to humans. So for example, there's some animals like pigs have very similar hearts to humans. You might test something, uh, a vaccine intended to prevent a virus that attacks the heart not on a pig. There are things where rats are sufficient. There are things where chimpanzees are used. Um, it is worth noting that vaccines and most pharmaceutical products are at some point tested on fetal tissues. Uh, there are lines of tissues that were actually derived from abortions that were performed in Sweden in the 1960s that have been bred successively for decades. Those, those fetal cells have been continually bred and uh, products are tested on those because you need to see how things are going to interact with human cells. And it's very easy to do that with fetal tissues, which can be propagated for a very long time. And this has caused some disconcertation from people who say that they have religious objections to this. Um, but what they often don't tell you is it's not just vaccines, but most pharmaceutical products at some time or other, and a lot of actually food products, so food colorings and flavorings and um, something that they put in potato chips to make them crispier. There are a lot of products out there that have been tested on people's tissues and people don't seem to care about, about those or be aware of those, but it, it's something that exists. Once we get through this animal testing, we do three rounds of testing on humans. Uh, phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials. First phase is usually 40 to 50 young, healthy adults. Um, we're testing to see if this is safe and non-toxic for all of them, if anybody has a bad reaction, um, if it's effective at all, you know, what, if there's any degree of effectiveness initially. Uh, and then once we get through that, and it usually takes about 18 months to do one of those trials, we move on to four to 500 people in a, a phase two clinical trial. We're testing a larger selection of people, different ethnicities, different health conditions. People may have particular diseases or infirmities. Uh, and then we go to a phase three clinical trial. We have four to 5,000 people. Um, and that's where we're really refining it down to. Uh, does it work? Does it work for anybody? What are the contraindications that we're going to put on the label? Uh, what is the precise dosing that is most effective? Uh, are you going to need multiple shots spread out over some period of time? And this is everywhere in the world. In fact, a lot of clinical trials are conducted in different countries because uh, there may be countries where it's just less expensive to conduct a clinical trial. We see a lot of clinical trials conducted in Africa, Southeast Asia, some in South America, a lot of clinical trials for COVID-19 or in Brazil. Clinical trials have to be overseen by an institutional review board with or university um, experts who are separate from and uninvolved in the trial itself, but examining how it's carried out to make sure it's going to be effective. Uh, participants have to give informed consent, and the trials really have to cover the right populations. They have to have a broad population. So sometimes you see a clinical trial that is conducted in a small country with a homogenous population, um, and you don't necessarily see if that product is going to have issues and it's used with a more diverse population. So you have to make sure that before something is released onto the market, you have uh, that more diverse population. And even after all this, there are rare instances where problems arise that were not captured in these clinical trials. Um, so in 1999, 1999, a rotavirus vaccine was developed and it was pulled from the market when it was found that it led to intussusception, which is a blockage, about one in 10,000 cases. Um, and I have the, the process here for applying in the United States. There's an investigational new drug act application and a biologics licensure application. These are all processes that you have to go to. You have to report your clinical trial outcomes, including your bad outcomes. Or, you know, if you, if you do a clinical trial for something, you say, oh, this doesn't work. We're not going to take it to the market. You still have to report that to FDA so that we have the data of, well, now we know what clinical formulation doesn't work. So let me get into what really matters for pharmacists, and that is, can you administer vaccines? So 
Now, my expertise is primarily in the United States. And in the U.S., every state does its own thing. We have 50 different sets of laws. There's no federal law on who can prescribe and administer drugs. Now, there's federal law that determines which drugs are prescription versus over-the-counter. And I think there are analogs to that in other countries. But in the United States, most drugs are prescription drugs that you need to go to a doctor and have the doctor write a prescription and say, yes, you need this drug. Um, and the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, makes the determination of what constitutes a prescription drug. But most states now allow pharmacists to prescribe vaccines. So the state decides who can prescribe medications. And generally, pharmacists can't just pres prescribe things like um, opioids or painkillers or uh, many other kinds of medications. For most states, they can prescribe vaccines. And there are some uh, twists that some states require the pharmacy to be uh, associated with a physician and have a particular physician that provides a protocol or a set of instructions as to how to administer the vaccine. Some states don't have that. Um, the pharmacists can do it all on their own. Um, and, you know, again, this, this varies very widely from state to state, not just in terms of whether they have a protocol or prescription or uh, some other regime like that, but also which vaccines are pharmacists permitted to administer? Is it the flu vaccine? Um, well, now it would be also COVID vaccines. Is it the childhood vaccines? Um, is it vaccines for older adults like the pneumococcal pneumonia vaccine or the shingles vaccine and things like that that tend to be administered to people in older age? That varies tremendously from state to state. Um, and there's no particular rhyme or rhythm to it. There's some states that are very permissive and pharmacists can basically prescribe and administer just about everything. And there are some that are more restrictive. Um, and it's the same around the world. So in Ireland, pharmacists have only been allowed to prescribe and administer flu vaccines since 2011. Uh, and before that, they couldn't at all. You had to go to a doctor to get the flu vaccine. Um, in Denmark, Portugal, Switzerland, and the UK, pharmacists can administer flu vaccines. In France, uh, they just gained the ability to do that in 2019. That's the most recent state. In some of these same countries, pharmacists can administer pneumococcal pneumonia, shingles, HPV vaccines, vaccines that are required for travel, such as yellow fever or Japanese encephalitis if you're going to certain parts of the world. Um, I've, I've only done a rough survey of this. I know that uh, pharmacists may administer vaccines in Argentina, Brazil, and Colombia. Um, there are other countries in South and Central America where they're not able to do that. It varies by the country. It may vary by uh, subdivisions within the country, states of those countries, or um, federal divisions. Um, now, as pharmacists, you may be wondering, uh, maybe a, a question on your mind, can you be required to be vaccinated? Um, in most of the world, it is a general principle, it's generally understood, that medical personnel may be required to be vaccinated for certain diseases. Um, it's fairly common. It depends on the disease, of course. But uh, for example, if you work with delivery of children, um, you'll want to be vaccinated for rubella. That's a common requirement. Uh, we want people to be vaccinated for measles and um, polio, for example. Uh, a lot of these are childhood vaccines, which in most countries, you will have gotten before you were even able to go to school or something of that sort. But um, speaking just for the United States, courts have held that uh, pharmacies can require pharmacists to be vaccinated. However, they have to provide certain exemptions. If you have an allergy to components of a vaccine um, and you can demonstrate that, there's a federal law and generally there are state laws that allow you to be exempted from vaccination on those grounds. Um, if you have sincerely held religious beliefs opposed to vaccination, which I'll say from the outset are, are mostly nonsense, people who claim to have those beliefs. Uh, there are very few religious systems that have a genuine vaccination. And the ones that, that do tend to be religions that oppose all medication on the grounds that uh, receiving medical care shows a lack of faith in divine providence to provide for you. Um, but because there are laws on the book that allow, books that allow people to have religious exemptions from vaccination, 
there are people who just don't want to be vaccinated and will claim it's against my religion. Um, my personal opinion is that braves religion uh, it turns it into a tool for, you know, okay, I don't, I'm getting out of doing what I don't want to do. But um, that is something that in the United States is a factor. Um, can pharmacists be required to perform vaccinations? There are some, there are certainly pharmacists who are opposed to vaccination, just as there are in any other walk of life, people who have uh, been subject to whatever misinformation there is about vaccines and um, have come to have opinions that vaccines are bad and I don't want to have anything to do with them. And in the US at least, courts have said that the pharmacy can, that is employing a pharmacist can say, well, either you have to administer vaccines um, or you're going to be fired. And even if you have a personal religious objection to vaccination for yourself, that doesn't apply to other people. You can't use that as grounds to refuse to vaccinate other people um, who are not objecting to being vaccinated. Um, so that's at least the situation in the United States. I would imagine that is reflected around the world. Um, there is no global scheme of vaccination mandates. The closest thing that we have to that is that when you travel from one country to another, some countries have uh, entry requirements where you have to be vaccinated to enter that country. But generally speaking, every country in the world makes its own determinations as to whether there are going to be vaccination mandates at all, whether anyone's going to be required to be vaccinated. Uh, and if so, who, what, what populations are going to be covered? Are children going to be required to have childhood vaccines? Are healthcare workers, including pharmacists, going to be required to have um, COVID vaccines or flu vaccines or other vaccines that would protect their patients from the spread of disease uh, through them as a vector? Um, there are some countries, Italy is an example, where the change in government has led to policy being changed back and forth over uh, what vaccine mandates are applied. And it's been, um, you know, I think it's been consistent in the past couple of years, but for a long time, it was inconsistent. And every time a new government got elected to office, um, the requirements would change completely. Uh, there's also a great deal of variety in the enforcement of the law. So there are plenty of countries that have vaccine laws on the books that are not enforced. So, um, there's no one making sure that people are vaccinated and it's really up to parents who are taking care of their children to be sure that they're in that proper care. Um, some countries enacted mandates for the first time ever in response to COVID-19. Uh, there was in fact a 2021 case of the European Court of Human Rights, a uh, case of Babrika and others versus the Czech Republic, which held that under EU law, uh, which rephrases some very broadly held principles of the right of privacy and, and family, that there's no violation of human rights to require people to be vaccinated, um, even if it's against their, their claimed uh, religious beliefs. And uh, there was a case in the United States called Jacobson v. Massachusetts, which was decided 100 and years before this in 1905 that came to the same conclusion for the United States that it doesn't violate the U.S. Constitution and any rights guaranteed under that document uh, for states to mandate vaccination in the United States. And by the way, uh, if you ever see old cases about vaccination, up until about the 1920s, virtually every case was a smallpox vaccine case. That was the only vaccine that was in widespread use until then. There's a, there's a very interesting set of cases in 1901 where a plague vaccine was mandated in San Francisco, and it was only mandated for Chinese people living in San Francisco, and representatives of that group sued, and the court actually threw it out because they said you, you can't have uh, a vaccination mandate directed at one ethnicity. That's a violation of equal protection. Um, but generally speaking, you know the cases you'll see will be smallpox cases. Um, and they generally come out in favor of the right of the state to mandate vaccination. Um, for people who will not be vaccinated, including people who are working as pharmacists, working in that field, uh, who for whatever reason have an exemption from vaccination or are being allowed by an employer not to be vaccinated, there are alternatives. Um, masking requirements are very common now. Um, in before 2020, there was actually a case in Canada that held that a masking requirement 
for people who are not vaccinated for influenza was unconstitutional under Canadian law. Um, but that has changed with COVID because now masking has become very common. Um, you can also require people to be tested for the disease. Uh, you can require them to be tested at set intervals or tested following um, likely exposure or following the experience of symptoms associated with the disease. Um, you can require antibody testing to see if people had antibodies for the disease. The entire point of vaccination being to cause those antibodies, those, those cells that stick to the virus and um, tell your white blood cells to devour it. Um, the point of vaccination is to get those into your body. If you have those through a prior infection or something like that, then for a while at least, uh, it makes sense that you wouldn't need to be vaccinated. You might get an exemption or um, you might use that as an alternative to vaccination. Although um, we know for COVID, the antibodies wear off uh, in some period of time. And there are a lot of diseases for which they wear off. You know, there are some polio, you get a polio vaccine, a series of polio vaccines when you're a small child and it lasts you your entire life. Um, diphtheria, uh, pertussis and tetanus, or DPT, or DTP rather. Um, later on in life, you'll get a DTaP booster. Uh, MMR, later in life, you may need boosters. Influenza, you need a new one every year. Um, COVID, you're probably going to need a new one every year. So antibody testing, may be okay for a while, um, but it, for a lot of vaccines, it's not a permanent solution. And then the final thing is that if you are an employer and you have a lot of employees and they do different tasks and some of them don't involve interacting with patients, you can assign them away from contact with patients. In the United States, you have to be careful that doing this is not perceived as punitive. It's not like a punishment. It's just for protection of your patients. Um, but, you know, around the world, generally, uh, where you have a large enough operation, you can do that where you're assigning someone to, okay, well, go do some part of the pharmacy ask that doesn't involve uh, administering vaccines. Uh, but where you have a very small operation, you may need everyone to be engaged in doing that. So it, it's possible that you may decide that none of these is as effective as requiring people to be vaccinated. So there's a famous case in the United States. Well, it's not that famous to me. It's famous because I do vaccine law. If you're in the field of vaccine law, you're familiar with this. It's called Brusevitz v. Wyeth. And it was written by Dr. Antoine Scalia of the Supreme Court, who um, relayed that the elimination of communicable diseases through vaccination was one of the greatest achievements of public health in the 20th century but in the 1970s and 1980s, vaccines became victims of their own success. They were so effective in preventing infectious diseases that people forgot to be afraid of the diseases and became more concerned that they would be injured by the vaccines. Um, now, we do have, in the United States and around the world, we have a vaccine adverse event reporting system. Uh, that's the name of it in the United States and the United Kingdom. It's called the Yellow Card Program. And in other countries, they have other names for this. But most countries have some kind of system for tracking injuries associated with the administration of a pharmaceutical product or specifically with a vaccine. In the U.S., we have a table. So if anyone receives a vaccine on the table, and this is just one example of some cells from the table, so you see what it looks like. If you receive a vaccine containing tetanus, whether it's just tetanus or in combination with any of these other things, and you have uh, an anaphylactic reaction within seven days, or brachial neuritis within 28 days, or a shoulder injury. Um, I just had actually uh, the shingles vaccine yesterday, and my arm is very sore right now. Um, but I'm not having, you know, I don't, I don't have a shoulder injury. Uh, of the kind that they're contemplating. You know, some people, um, if there is a poor vaccination technique and the vaccine matter is injected into the wrong part of the body, it goes into a nerve instead of into, into a blood vessel, um, they can develop uh, severe pain and, and inability to move their arm and so forth. Um, Vasovagal syncope, you're probably familiar with, that means fainting, um, or any acute complications or sequelae. So if you have any of these, um, 
reactions occur within that certain period of time to this particular vaccine, then you're supposed to report that um, to the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, which is a website people can go to, and it'll ask for all sorts of information. Who is the recipient? What was the vaccine? Um, what are the symptoms? Uh, and that is used for a number of different purposes, but primarily to track whether there's a pattern of adverse events that can be attributed to a particular vaccine, to a particular um, series or skew uh, of that vaccine being produced, a particular batch. Um, and there are different requirements as to who has to report. So if you're a manufacturer of a vaccine, you're legally required to report any serious adverse event of which you become aware. Uh, physicians and pharmacists and others uh, in the medical health field, those who are administering the vaccine, are generally not required by law. There are some jurisdictions where they are, but they're generally not required by law to report, um, but they usually have an ethical requirement to report these injuries if they become aware of them. Um, we also have employers who are generally not required to file a VAERS report for an employee who has a reaction, um, but should encourage employees to file one. And uh, in the United States, at least anybody else can file a VAERS report, um, which means that the system is susceptible to people filing a bunch of garbage in it, um, maybe for nefarious reasons, maybe because they're opposed to vaccination and want to create an appearance to the vaccine is harmful, or maybe because, you know, they, they genuinely have a fear that some non-correlative thing, you know, we see reports of, um, well, this person received the vaccine and the next day they were driving and they got into a fender bender, uh, and maybe the vaccine caused that, the, the, the person filing the report may think. Um, that's generally not the case. Usually car accidents happen all by themselves, but you find various reports of that kind. Um, if a problem is found with a vaccine, it can be recalled from the market. Every country has some authority to recall pharmaceutical products from circulation if problems problem is found with them. Um, but as I noted, the VAERS data is very easily manipulated. So it can't be introduced in the court of law as proof of, of, a, of an injury. Um, now we have an anti-vaccine movement that's going on around the world and it affects pharmacists as much and possibly more than most people uh, because pharmacists will be on the front line of administering vaccines. And there are a lot of different reasons why people begin to become uh, against vaccination. Um, some of them are just very libertarian and think, well, the government shouldn't require people to have any kind of, you shouldn't require healthy people to receive a medical product uh, just to protect others from becoming ill. Uh, some people do have religious or philosophical arguments you know, there are religious objections. Uh, historically, when the smallpox vaccine was developed in the 1790s, the first objection that was raised was um, that people who get sick and die from smallpox are receiving divine judgment, and it's God's will, and vaccinating them is trying to thwart God's will. Um, or kind of more esoterically, there are people who believe that uh, getting medications it shows a lack of faith that uh, prayer will heal you or things of that sort. And therefore you shouldn't be required to get any kind of medical treatment. Um, there are people who believe that the vaccines or particular ingredients in vaccines are actually harmful. They tend to uh, claim that the decline of disease is due to factors other than vaccines. It's very interesting. If you look at the history of diseases around the world, every single disease substantially in incidents shortly after a vaccine was introduced for that disease. So measles used to be um, a tremendous killer around the world. I think one out of every um, one out of every thousand people in the world died of measles at one point, and now hardly any people die from measles. Um, and it was shortly after the measles vaccine was successfully introduced that those numbers started to drop off. That was in the 1930s. Uh, 1940s, measles began, vaccines began to be widely administered. Uh, for polio, the vaccine wasn't developed until the 1960s. As soon as the polio vaccine was introduced, the rates dropped off substantially. Um, the HPV vaccine was developed in the 2000s, began to be 
widely used and we have since seen like an 85% decline in cervical cancer, which is what the HPV vaccine prevents, prevents a virus that causes cervical cancer. But there are people who don't believe in vaccines and will say that it had nothing to do with the vaccine. It was just people had better hygiene or there was better water quality or something like that as responsible for each of those particular drop-offs. Um, and people will also argue that medical that uh, natural immunity is better than vaccine-mediated immunity. Well, I argue with people all the time on social media platforms who say that it's healthier to get measles or to get polio than to be vaccinated for them. Um, that is just positively insane. But you know, people who believe that vaccines are really bad are, are inclined to believe that. Uh, there are also what are sort of generally anti-capitalist arguments for the pharmaceutical companies. They have shareholders and issue stocks and uh, they turn a profit. And certainly they are profitable enterprises and profit-seeking enterprises. So it is imagined that um, they're willing to do everything they can to push harmful products on people so they can make money from it. Um, and of course, that the government officials and the politicians and the judges and the entire scientific community is in the pocket of the pharmaceutical companies and, and is only making determinations that um, pharmaceutical products are safe and effective because they're being paid to. And then at the kind of extreme end, you have people who think that vaccines are just a way to secrete microchips into your body so the government can track you or make you magnetic or um, send signals to you through 5G. Um, or that vaccines are a form of population control and are actually intended to kill people instead of um, helping to save people uh, out of some desire to limit the population or have some specific popu set population uh, and not grow from that, which is kind of remarkable considering that if you really wanted population control, well, 6 million people died from COVID um, and but for vaccination, millions more would have died. Um, here's just a, an illustration from the 18th century or the early uh, 19th century of people objecting to the smallpox vaccine because it was cultured in cows and there was this idea at the time that um, if you got the smallpox vaccine, um, that meant you were putting cow cells in your body and might partially turn into a cow. Literally. Um, and that's nonsensical, but it's the same kind of thing that has been refined and, and uh, rephrased towards modern vaccines. Uh, there's also intentional seeding of mistrust for vaccines for political ends. We have found that there are some government agencies uh, from governments that are hostile to the United States or um, hostile to Western powers or whatever you want to call them, um, that have disseminated misinformation typically in order to foment uh, conflict. So they have people who get out there on social media platforms like Twitter and Facebook and put out a lot of anti-vaccine uh, memory, anti-vaccine slogans and things of that sort, um, and also put out pro-vaccine uh, content, but the pro-vaccine content usually tends to be very hostile and aggressive and kind of violently directed at people opposed to vaccination saying, you know, vaccines work and I hope you die or something like that, um, which is not conducive to conversation, of course. It just that creates dissension. Um, but that has that has rolled around the world. So the countries that uh, we believe are responsible for disseminating that kind of information are also seeing growing anti-vaccine movements because that information has been translated back to those countries. Um, and the results of this, we have seen uh, protesters disrupting vaccination efforts. We had mass vaccinations for COVID. We had people actually protesting vaccination or, or trying to delay it. We had people in different countries, this is uh, the US and the UK and Australia, people were making fake vaccine appointments and then not showing up for them um, with the idea that the vaccines would spoil. Actually, I think the Israel, so Israel, uh, Australia, and the UK, and this also happened in the United States, uh, 
Um, it wasn't very effective because so many doses of the vaccine were manufactured so quickly, ultimately, that, you know, block booking appointments just meant that uh, the people who were actually waiting in line would get moved up in line because somebody hadn't shown up and would still get the vaccines. But people tried to do this. They tried to prevent people who wanted to be vaccinated from getting vaccinated by protesting the site or um, going online and booking the appointments, things of that sort. Uh, there is also a case in the United States, and this is not entirely isolated, where a pharmacist in Wisconsin who had been inundated with anti-vaccine rhetoric came to believe the COVID vaccine was bad. And he took a couple dozen vials of the vaccine out of the refrigerator because, you know, they had to be kept in, in a deep freeze and he left them out overnight so they would spoil. And then he injected them into people. Um, and now nobody got sick from this. But uh, first of all, they could have because, you know, we don't test the effects of spoiled vaccines on people. Um, we don't necessarily know what those are. Uh, but also, these are people who believe that they were being vaccinated, that they were being protected from the disease, and instead they were given something that had been rendered inert. Um, and it's, it's just mind-boggling that someone would do that. The person, of course, was stripped from their license to practice and uh, eventually uh, in prison for a number of years. And I think he's still in prison now, which good, he should be. Um, but that's a pharmacist, a pharmacist who has been um, convinced by anti-vaccine rhetoric that he was doing a good thing by doing that. There's actually a case in Germany where there was a nurse who was giving people saline shots instead of um, COVID vaccines. And this was primarily to elderly people who are in the most vulnerable group. And that's, that's who this, uh, this Wisconsin person would have been giving them to as well, uh, given the, the timing in January 2021. But in Germany, this, this woman may have given as many as 6,000 people false doses of the vaccine and allowed them to think that they had been vaccinated. Um, and she was ultimately sentenced only for six cases out of those 6,000 because that there was one instance where she was caught, caught giving saline to six people. She claimed that that was an accident, um, but uh, it's generally believed that she had given uh, that kind of false hope to thousands of people. Um, and that's highly problematic because then you have people who believe that they're vaccinated. And to the extent that you have systems that record uh, who has been vaccinated and who hasn't, those systems are showing the wrong information. They're showing that someone's been vaccinated. If that person develops the disease and dies from it, that calls into question the effectiveness of the vaccine. And in these cases, the people aren't vaccinated at all. And we have something similar going on with the use of fake vaccination cards. We have falsification of vaccination records going on. The earliest cases of this were just people in the United States where you had a paper card saying you're vaccinated, um, getting fake copies of that card. But uh, shortly thereafter, we had situations where healthcare professionals were charging people money to falsify their vaccination records. You know, we have a lot of vaccination mandates and people need to show in their, in their records that they were vaccinated in order to continue working. Um, as a healthcare professional or as a municipal employee, a bus driver or something like that, a police officer or a firefighter. Um, so we had this case in New York where nurses made one and a half million dollars selling fake vaccination records and putting that information into the official government system. Um, now, you're not going to get away with that forever. No one's going to be able to pull that off long term. Um, so they got caught. We have another case of uh, a nurse in Michigan who is uh, providing false immunization records for a couple hundred dollars a piece. Um, another one in Columbia, uh, South Carolina. So this has gone on. This has also gone on in other parts of the world. These are the cases I'm familiar with in the United States. Um, but there are cases in Australia, Italy, Greece that I'm familiar with. Um, and again, this introduces uh, some very dangerous information to the system because it creates a false impression of people being vaccinated 
um, that would enable them to be put in situations where they would be susceptible to exposure to the disease uh, when they shouldn't be because they're really not vaccinated. And it creates a false record of, you know, when someone um, comes ill with a disease and you think they're vaccinated, the record shows they're vaccinated, that may affect how they're treated and it may affect confidence in the vaccines uh, when people who are supposedly vaccinated have a bad experience with the disease, uh, which the vaccine is intended to prevent. Um, so actually this kind of recaps that, but yeah, that's there's there's a lot of concern. You know, this arose with respect to COVID-19. There's a lot of concern that people who are against vaccination are going to start doing this widely with respect to childhood vaccines. And then you'll have children in a classroom who could serve as a vector for spreading a disease and you think they're vaccinated and you think they're uh, protected against being the vector through which that disease spreads to other children, possibly to children who are unvaccinated because they have a medical um, reason why they can't be vaccinated. Uh, so that concludes my presentation. And I'm sorry that there was a lot of negative and dour stuff in there, but we are kind of in a crisis um, with respect to vaccination. And it's one that is growing rather than receding in terms of confidence in vaccines. Um, and this is me, as I was introduced at the beginning, I'm chair of the National Vaccine Law Conference. I teach vaccine law at the FIU College of Law. I'm the author of the Vaccine Vaccination Immunization Law Treaties. Um, I have a website, brianddnaverson.com. Please feel free to email me or to uh, connect with me via Twitter. Uh, my Twitter is there, and it has been a pleasure speaking with you, and um, I am going to stop the sharing of the screen, and uh, I can send this uh, PowerPoint to um, the organizers if you'd like, if you want to make this available to students, I'm, I'm glad to distribute it. Um, and I also see that there are some comments in the chat. I have a quick look and see if there are any direct questions for me. Okay, no, this is just saying that if there are questions you can ask. Them. So um, I, am, I am open to questions. Yes, so please, if you have any question, please send it in the chat. We have received some questions in the private chat, so I will share it with you. Uh, if you want to turn on your microphone, please raise your hand and make the question. Uh, okay, so the first question that we have here is, Professor, do you think there is some kind of approach that will be efficient to explain to religious people who refuse to get vaccinated about the relevance of vaccination? So the first thing that I think needs to be done with respect to religious objections to engage leaders in the religious community. And we have done that with some success in the United States. Um, and really every major religion in the world that has any kind of hierarchical structure or people who are the arbiters of what their doctrine is, has come out with statements in support of vaccination, particularly in support of childhood vaccination, many of them in support of COVID vaccination. So it's certainly useful to show people um, who have those kinds of objections that you know the people who have the real doctrinal expertise and, and what your religion requires, they um, they don't say that you should not be vaccinated. Now, I personally have also um, been a strong advocate of developing or redeveloping vaccines in ways that they don't have um, some of the religious formities or objections that people raise. So. You know, I've been working with a group in the United States to develop um, a pool of fetal cells for testing that come from miscarriages rather than abortions, because abortion is a very fraught religious issue. And if you have another source of fetal cells that doesn't have that issue, then that at least would remove a basis for religious objections. Um, again, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big champion of finding uses of um, mediums for the, the breeding of cells that don't involve um, animals and find substitutes for that, then people who have objections to the use of pork products or beef products or any animal product um, can be alleviated of that. But the, the more fundamental kind of objection from people who think that, you know, I shouldn't receive any medical treatment at all because it shows a lack of faith in 
in Providence or something like that. Um, I will say that there's generally a principle groups like that, that if the law requires you to do something, you obey the law. It's not showing a lack of, of faith in the divine if you're just obeying secular laws that have been imposed upon you. Um, but, you know, I think um, there are an array of different approaches that can be taken with that. Um, but the chief and most important thing is to engage religious leaders and have them tell their communities um, it's okay to be vaccinated. It's really recommended to be vaccinated. The, the Roman Catholic Church, for example, which is, um, I think, the largest single religious entity on the planet, um, has issued a statement saying that um, it's better it's better to be vaccinated than not to be vaccinated. Even though, if you can avoid using a vaccine um, that has the fetal testing issue uh, in favor of a vaccine that does not have that issue, you should definitely. Uh, avoid the one that's been testing, but vaccination is is still recommended and is uh, the morally better. So yeah, that's that's my general answer to that. Um, I mean, it's very hard to counsel people and tell them, well, your your religious beliefs are wrong. Um, that's that's not re what your religion really says. Um, but sometimes you you just have to tell people that. Yes, I've th I've seen that also. Uh, there are spaces where communities like they don't trust and uh, like medical doctors or like the healthcare uh, the professionals. So uh, sometimes it's something about that. So also working on that could also help us to get into those uh, communities and connect with religious leaders and all that. Maybe that could also be an approach. Okay, uh -huh. we have a comment here that is thanks for this activity. The variety of viewpoints consider is really motivating for it, inclusivity approaches. Uh -huh. We have another question here that is Professor, do you consider that needing prescription to get vaccine lowers the chance of the population in general getting access to vaccination? As you mentioned, that happens in the United States. Absolutely. Um, yes, obviously, anything that is a barrier to getting vaccinated is going to have some effect on lowering the number of people who get vaccinated because there may be people who just don't have time in the day to go and get a prescription in one place and then get a vaccine the other another. Um, the way that it's structured in the United States is that we say that pharmacists are authorized to prescribe the vaccine. It doesn't need to be prescribed by a doctor. Uh, so you still have a requirement for a prescription, but it's one stop. It's, you go to the pharmacist, you say, you know, here's my child, he's two months old. Um, what are the vaccines that are required for a two month old? And the pharmacist is able to administer them. Um, certainly more so with, with influenza and you know, COVID vaccines and adult vaccines. Uh, children usually are taken to a pediatrician and most childhood vaccines are administered by pediatricians. Um, but the more routes that you open up for vaccination, the more vaccination you're going to have in society. So that, that yes, that's, that absolutely makes sense. Um, now, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that vaccines uh, cease to be prescription drugs. Um, widening the, the range of uh, who can prescribe them is there have been proposals for nasal flu vaccines to be made non-prescription drugs uh, to be available over the counter and you know there's there's a certain principle if you if you administer vaccines and you're probably uh, more aware of this than I am or more familiar with this than I am there is a protocol for evaluation and then administration, and then observation after administration to see if someone has a bad reaction to a vaccine. Um, and because there are, even if it's a very small number, um, some people who have adverse reactions to vaccines, generally considered important that they receive vaccines in an environment where they can be observed. Um, so, you know, when, when you go to the pharmacist and get a vaccine, they'll tell you, wait, 
minutes before you go to make sure that you don't have some sort of immediate reaction. And if people were administering vaccines to themselves at home, there would certainly be a greater uh, possibility of someone having a serious adverse reaction uh, and being all by themselves with no one to help them deal with that. Um, but for, for nasal flu vaccines, which are relatively inert and can have minimal reactions um, and don't require an injection, so you don't have any of the potential complications accompanying an injection, you know, there's a reasonable case for those to be over the counter. It's just not something that has happened anywhere yet. Okay, thank you. I think it's a really interesting process. Uh, um, it's really interesting, like the reason why they have that that process. Uh, for example, I am from Venezuela, and we don't have like a follow up system on like people that get vaccinations that it, that get vaccinated, and we lost that data. And we don't know what happens later. So it's really interesting because it's a data that we also need to do uh, to improve uh, our work on vaccines. So if you have another question, uh, participants, you can share it in the chat or raise your hand. The last one that I have here is, I think your background is really interesting. Can you tell us a little more on how did you end up focusing on career on vaccine law? Focusing your career on vaccine law. Yeah, if you want to know my biography, <laughs> yeah, um, I will tell you. When I was I was a law student, um, I didn't particularly know what I was going to do in the practice of law. And I, I will say this is a general life principle. Um, at every point in my life, if you have told me, well, five years from now you'll be doing this, um, I wouldn't have believed you. And and that's just like every every single every single kind of period or epoch of my life, there's been some point where, you know, if you told me five years from now, you'd be carrying a conference. I'm like, no, I am. Um, so when, when I came out of law school, I went into intellectual property, actually, which is patent, trademarks, and copyrights. Um, and I worked with an intellectual property firm for a couple of years. Um, and I really enjoyed the field of law from kind of an academic perspective, um, but I didn't enjoy uh, the kind of grind of being a lawyer um, in a, we have, we have a system and I don't know if it's replicated much around the world, but called billable hours, where uh, if you're a, a lower level person in a law firm, you have to have a certain number of hours that you can build to clients uh, over the course of every month and that's, you know, in addition to a lot of um, kind of bureaucratic work that you have to do as part of the job. So I didn't enjoy that. And I decided I wanted to further my education. And that's so why I came up to um, Northern Virginia to pursue an LLM in uh, intellectual property law. And it turns out that the school that I was accepted to for that program is a school that provides a lot of law clerks to the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, which I had mentioned. And the Federal Circuit is primarily a patent court. Um, so at that point, I had no kind of inkling of vaccine law, um, but uh, I got hired for the Federal Circuit job and decided uh, in advance of that, that, well, I, I got hired two years out, you know, which is what they do nowadays to say, okay, um, it's 2000 and, uh, 2008, I'm gonna hire you for this job that you're gonna do from 2010 to 2012. I had all this time to fill. So um, I got an internship on the Court of Federal Claims. And the first case that got put in my hands when I walked into the door for that was a vaccine injury case. And I was absolutely fascinated by the doctrine of it because the, the vaccine injury cases under the Court of Federal Claims, they function differently from any other kind of um, the area of law is called torts. So torts is like wrongs. If you're injured by someone, um, you know, you can go to court and you can sue and say, well, this person uh, was negligent and it caused me to be injured. You know, there are all sorts of, there's, there's, there's no end to the number of possible uh, variations of tort law. But the, the vaccine claims were different from anything else. 
um, they had a lower standard of proof. So it's it's easier to get compensation, even if you can't prove that the vaccine itself is the cause of the injury. Um, and the fact patterns or historically for these cases tend to be uh, very heartbreaking. You know, they tend to be children who assertedly have um, a very bad reaction, a very anaphylactic reaction or something of that sort, uh, and are badly injured by it. Um, but, you know, when, when I finally got to the federal circuit, I tried to work on as many of those cases as possible and them to be really, really interesting. Um, and as I mentioned at the top, I was working on one of those cases at the same time that I was working on a vaccine injury case. And I remembered actually in that moment and in my first year of law school, one of the very first cases that we discussed was a, an 1890s case of a woman who had come from Ireland to the United States on a ship. And when she arrived in Boston, uh, she was told that she was required to have smallpox vaccination and she didn't want to get it. Um, and they basically took her aside and said, we can't enter the country unless you get it. And she felt like she was forced into getting it. So later she sued and said it was um, without her consent. And the court said, uh, it's not plausible that you would have sailed all the way across the ocean um, only to be refused entry to the United States because he didn't have his vaccination. Uh, so the court found that she wasn't coerced. Um, but, you know, that's, that's, uh, I remembered reading that case um, and thinking about how we have all these vaccination mandates now. And vaccines are the only medical product that we require a healthy person to receive in order to prevent them from future illness. You know, there are a lot of things we recommend. We tell people to take vitamins, get vitamin C in your diet and eat green vegetables and so forth. But there's no law requiring that anyone do any of that. Um, you know, and, and even I'll say in, in the United States, I, I don't know if it's different in other countries, but in the United States, you can be a parent of a child and feed your child nothing but chicken McNuggets and Coca-Cola and it's legally allowed. You know, it, it doesn't make sense and it's not healthy for them, but they're not gonna come and take your child away just because you give them nothing but junk food. Um, but you are required to vaccinate your children. So thinking about that in that moment kind of drew it all together for me. I said, okay, I'm going to write a, a treatise on all these different areas of vaccine law, uh, which demonstrate that there is this broad public policy preference for protecting society against spread of infectious disease. And um, when I finished my clerkship, I started working on that. And I went to a bunch of publishers in the legal industry, and they all said, there's not going to be any interest in this book. It's such a niche topic. No one cares about vaccine law. No one cares about vaccines and requirements and so forth. Uh, <laughs> and it took me five years get a publisher to be willing to publish the book. And it came out right before COVID. So that's that's the long winding story of how I ended up being in this position. But um, I'm very um, glad now. I think I'm privileged to be able to be an advocate of vaccine law and be able to use my voice um, to spread the importance of vaccines and to convey to people who are in the field um, first of all, knowledge that they should have that about things that they may be confronted with. Because you, as again, as a pharmacist, may um, deal with someone who says, oh, I shouldn't get vaccinated because, you know, vaccines aren't tested in placebo studies. That's not true. They are. Or because the whatever government agencies approve vaccines are only approving them because they're getting bribed by the pharmaceutical companies. And, um, that's not true. They're not. The same vaccines are being approved by pharmaceutical regulatory agencies all over the world, uh, each making their own very searching examination of them. So, you know, it's it's important to me to be able to be uh, playing that part in the conversation. Well, thank you very much for, for joining to this health world. Uh, without being like originally a healthcare provider or worker, because uh, health is something that is uh, 
faculty professional like everyone have to join on this to like achieve the goals that we have planned on this so thank you very much for being here also in this uh session in this webinar uh if you have any question if the participants have any question i don't see any other question or any uh, hand raised so yeah and if anybody else has questions um i have provided my email and my twitter so feel free to contact me through those routes and thank you so much for having me it has been a pleasure to be here thank you very much for being here and for your time sharing your experience and sharing your uh life too <laughs> um so now in the second part of this well, the third part of this session we'll be sharing a little bit uh with the participants some institutional information uh professor if you want to stay here to uh listen a little bit about that you can stay or not uh you can also leave the meeting and thank you very uh, much i have that. dinner actually it's late where i am but um thank you so much again for having me and i will certainly be in touch and follow up Thanks to you. So, well, yeah, no. Oh, I just made myself. <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, it is really interesting to have you here uh, and to learn about all this information about vaccine and how uh, this could affect us and what we can do on that. So, I will be sharing my screen to share with you some resources that we have in IFMSA related to vaccination. The first thing that I'll be sharing is the SCOF Resource Center. I'm sharing the links on the chat. So the first resource, let me share my screen one second. Okay, it's here. Okay, you can open the first link. Do you see my screen? Okay, thank you, Sophia. <laughs> Moving in. So now you can see here that we have a whole section on uh, like what you can do to increase the rate of vaccination. It is all about vaccination. Uh, links related to many things, vaccines 101, if you want to deliver a session related to that, uh, childhood vaccines, adult vaccination. We also have here some multimedia resources if you want to like include those things in any session that you would like to deliver or if you want to learn more about it uh we have here also two important things that are the ifmsa publication and ifmsa statements the ifmsa publications are two uh this one here is outdated uh, i've shared the current uh, link the current policy document on vaccination that we have from IFMSA but you can also find the vaccination training manual and the statements that IFMSA have delivered in the uh, executive meeting sessions of the WHO of the World Health Organization if you want to go through it and I will go now to this document that is the vaccination training manual where you can learn the basics on vaccination and also you can uh, go to a section where you can learn how to deliver sessions on that as we are um, like medical students and pharmaceutical students uh, that are part of these organizations I think that we are uh, we have the responsibility maybe sometimes <laughs> to uh, share this information with everyone and to be uh, like to share this information with them and if we learn how to do it properly and in the best way you know to cultivate everyone and to like let everyone feel the importance of this you can learn how to do it here in this capacity building bar where you can also find like uh, logistics, uh, activities that you can try, uh, role playing activities, simulations, and all that. Also, here we have the policy document uh, that is a document that shows the position of IFMSA in uh, on an issue. You can find all the policy documents of IFMSA in our official webpage. 
And here you can read a little bit more about the position of IFMSA uh, related on, like the position of IFMSA on several issues related to vaccination and also or call to actions to different institutions or uh, organs. For example, the government's ministers of health, uh, who uh, healthcare professionals, educators, uh, NGOs, IFMSA members to NMOs, One Health partners, people that are working on One Health, and uh, like all this information that we, all these call to actions uh, that we share with them in order to achieve the goals that we have proposed like globally on this. So yes, that's it. Uh, if you want to find that, you remember that you have the Scope Resource Center here is the first link. The second link is the policy document where you can set the position of IFMSA on uh, like vaccination issues and the vaccination training manual that is a document created by IFMSA. Thank you very much for listening and Sophia, the floor is yours. Well, um, I don't have a table like <laughs> But I, I was able to find the two most recent documents on, that IPSF has on vaccination. So I will send you the link in case you want to check. So we have two things here. I will share my screen. You, you have shared it like with me. Uh, I will send it to everyone. Oh, sorry. Don't worry, don't worry. Done. I know. How can I take this? Okay, don't worry. I'll just make it smaller. So what we have here, we I found two documents. So one is actually IFMSA and IPSF. It is a statement on UN about IFMSA and IPSF agenda for 2022 until 2030. So here we are committing to create events and advocate about vaccination. And here we have the IPSF advocacy toolkit. And here, if you take your time to read, you'll find seven sections. So we have general context. What is this toolkit about? Who is this toolkit for? Why develop an advocacy strategy? Developing the advocacy strategy and steps that you need to follow. So it's pretty much like an instruction manual. manual. It is pretty easy to read. So I would recommend if you are interested. And that's basically it. So I would like to say thank you so much for everyone for joining and for like spending your Saturday night here with us today. And I hope to see you guys on the next one. Bye. Bye, thank you very much for joining. We're going to share uh, the presentation when we get it and um, this recording later. So thank you very much for joining. See you later.